Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Tambrellas webinar. I am going to do a brief introduction and then I will introduce our speaker who will give us the talk and then we'll open up for question and answer at the end. This webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the Tambrellas YouTube channel in the next 24 to 48 hours. The Tambrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are a nonprofit organization. Behind uh, the team that made this possible, here with me, we have Reshma, who's uh, the director and a community manager. We also have Christina and Sangam, who made it possible for this uh, event to happen. We have a code of conduct, and we thank you for helping make the Tambrella a welcoming community and uh, a welcoming community for all. You can support us in various ways. So one is by following a code of conduct so that we make our community welcoming and collaborative. You can also share the Tambrella events with us. You can also contribute to our various open source um, initiatives like contributing to our video timestamps. For example, if you're interested in contributing to the video timestamps of uh, this event, we have instructions on our GitHub page. You can also look at our new website. We also have a Data Umbrella blog, uh, which you can help by making some updates to it. We also have a Data Events board, uh, where we're trying to compile um, most of our events, uh, especially in the open source and data science area into one whole database. You can also donate to a nonprofit. You can donate to us through Open Collective and Benevity. You can subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. This is where we post all the videos to our previous events. And this is also where this uh, event will be posted. On our YouTube channel, you can get various playlists like playlists on advice, data visualization, contributing to open source, scikit-learn, PyMC, and NumPy. You can also sign up to a monthly newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out once every month at the beginning of the of the month, uh, we are on Substack, so you, uh, you can go ahead on Substack and um, subscribe to our newsletter. We are across all social media platforms. Meetup is where you'll find upcoming events. YouTube is where you'll find videos to our previous events. Uh, newsletters so that you can stay updated with news around open source and upcoming events. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook is where we share news uh, to our community. For this particular event, we have live captioning. So at the top of um, your screen, there's a um, button label CC. So feel free to use it if you want to uh, like follow the live captioning while the speaker is presenting. We also have an online suggestion box. So if you have any feedback regarding this event, if you have suggestions for future event topics, technical issues in case you encounter any and any other general feedback that you think might be useful, feel free to um, use the link and leave the feedback. Uh, for upcoming events next month, on 12th March, we have an event or introduction to bash scripting. So look out for that as well. You can uh, RSVP for it on Meetup. So on today's talk, so today's talk, we're going to have a talk on a briefer history of open source. And our speaker today is Juan. So Juan works as a product manager at Quantum Black AI by Mike McKinsey uh, with a focus on Kidro, which is an open source data science framework. He has a decade of experience as a developer advocate, software engineer, and Python trainer in several industries. Uh, he's a PSA Fellow since 2017, and he has made significant contributions to the PyData stack, published several open source packages, and organized the first seven PyCons in Spain. Currently, he is the lead organizer of the PyData Madrid monthly meetups. You can find him on LinkedIn and GitHub. The links are available on the slides, and the slides will be available on our handout section. And with that, I will now leave the microphone and the video to one. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Beryl, for the introduction. Very happy to be here. I'm going to now be sharing my screen. Uh, hold on. Okay, you can see, can you confirm you see my slides if I do this? No, we see. No, you don't. Okay, so let's try something else. 
What about now? Yeah, I can see them well. Fantastic. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this presentation that I called A Briefer History of Open Source, a Computational and Human Perspective. I have to say this has been one of the most uh, fun presentations to prepare and possibly among the most uh, difficult ones, but I enjoyed um, going through the notes and all Wikipedia articles and ancient material that only can be found in web archive these days and discovering the history of the amazing humans behind the technology that we use every single day. So I hope that you enjoy. We're going to start by going to the very beginning of the history of open source for which we need to go to the very beginning of the history of computing. But before that, Allow me to reintroduce myself very quickly. Um, so my name is Juan Luis. I'm originally an aerospace engineer that then uh, I turned uh, into a software engineer slash data scientist. And then I became a developer advocate. And now I'm a product manager. So you see sometimes trajectories in the tech world are very non-linear. I'm passionate about tech communities uh, that has been something that hasn't changed in the past decades uh, of me being involved in the open source world. And lately I've become very fond of the solidarity economy. I'm currently working for Kedro at Quantum Black, Quantum Black, which is an open source pipeline framework. And I'm fortunate to be able to devote my full-time job as well to the open source community. And as Beryl mentioned in the introduction, I'm organizer of the PyData Madrid uh, monthly meetups. So I would be very happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. If you do send a request, please add a message that says, hey, I saw your presentation, uh, or just quickly introduce yourself. So there's a very important uh, warning that I have to give before this presentation, and it's that I'm not a historian. You see from the previous slide, I've were uh, many different hats during my professional life, but um, studying history has not been one of them. So it's important to bear in mind that the perspective I'm going to give in this presentation is subjective. And specifically, I'm a white guy in the South uh, West European country. So that obviously affects my worldview. Um, I divided the presentation in several uh, sections, uh, historical moments and so on, but the cutoff points are completely arbitrary and serve the storytelling. Um, and there's a possibility that I have missed uh, some key events uh, or people, um, which was not uh, intentional. And if anything, I did so in the interest of time or out of ignorance. Um, I might uh, drop some opinions. I will try to stay as objective as possible, though. And again, I like this topic too much. Honestly, I think we could be talking about this for hours. Um, but I will try to make it uh, briefer, as the title implies. So one thing um, I want to say, um, uh, the presentation is divided in sections. So I'm going to uh go through the end just so i then i don't have to change the screen and so on uh, but please if anything comes up during the presentation and you have any question or comments um or anything like that uh, drop it in the chat and we will try to read everything uh, towards the end so having said that let's go so as i said i'm going to uh, start with the very beginning of uh, the history of computing. I call this session the rise and fall of hacker culture. And just to make it very clear that this is a subjective um, uh, perspective, I spiced the title slides with some um, uh, album covers for um, music that I really like from that decade, which also uh, allows us to position all these moments in time. So we're talking about the 50s and 60s, and computing was nothing like um, we can imagine it now. Um, programmers were using punch cards and very arcane methods 
to type their programs into the computers. And such computers were enormous devices that took uh, the place of a full room uh, almost. This photograph is from a PDP-10, which was one of the famous um, computers that could be found in research departments and at universities and so on. And the important thing here is that at the very beginning of this story, um, programming in general was mostly an academic activity. Uh, we're talking about very low level languages. Some programs were still written in assembly directly. Um, the debugging cycles were extremely long and this was not yet um, ready for business. But the interesting thing about that is that um, this academic notion of sharing knowledge, publishing articles, uh, exchanging ideas and so on, permeated the whole world of computing. And this had a very important effect on everything that came after that. So interestingly, it was very normal in the uh, 60s and beginning of the 70s to just share the code you know, with analog methods uh, back then. But even though there was no notion yet of open source or free software, it was still uh, pretty much the norm. In this context, um, there was uh, uh, one of the important events in our story is the creation of Unix, uh, the Unix family of operating systems, which came about at the same time as the creation of the C programming language. So um, people like Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, and many others started developing uh, Unix at Bell Labs, which was a research institution back in the US that was doing lots of uh, different things. And they published this system internally first in 1971. And at the same time, they were writing a new language called C because the programmers were not really happy with the uh, state of affairs uh, that they had back then, which was mostly uh, Fortran and, and little else. So uh, they started creating this programming language before it was called the B programming language. And then uh, the next evolution was uh, the letter C. And after the first attempt of at rewriting the kernel in C that uh, initially failed, they finally announced uh, Unix outside of Bell Labs in 1973. And this gave us uh, a super important programming language that has been the basis of lots of developments that have been created in the past 50 years. And also, the even if the Unix family of operating system is not uh, very mainstream anymore, um, it was uh, essential for the evolution of Linux, as we're going to see later on. There's one uh, cool bit that I rescued from what they call the Unix philosophy, which is this make each program do one thing well. So if you've ever interacted with the terminal on Linux or Mac and you found yourself piping different commands, so you do ls and then sort and then cut, you know, things like that. That The philosophy that underpins um, that chain of commands is the Unix philosophy. So the idea is that instead of creating a monolith that does everything, um, the work should be done by composing small programs. And I find it super interesting that this idea lives on to this day. However, there's another really important event that happened around that time, which is the Copyright Act of the United States of America of 1976. And the reasons why I'm uh, putting this here are twofold. Uh, but first of all, and this was uh, a long time in the making, uh, the first attempts at adapting the super old copyright law of the US uh, had been done in the 50s. And the truth is that they had been working with uh, uh, some copyright uh, legislation from the very beginning of the century, before the television was invented, before the radio was invented. So they urgently needed to converge with the rest of the countries of the world that were trying to uh, have a unified uh, 
set of rules to approach copyright. And also, in general, uh, try to offer solutions for creators in an economy that was increasingly dependent on uh, telecommunications and so on. So there's a couple of things from this uh, law that are interesting to us. First of all, uh, it introduced uh, literary works as an object that's protected by copyrights. That's in the, um, the definitions and the subject matter and so on. And it turns out that software falls under the definition of literary works, which means that software can be copyrighted. And this, of course, software was a new thing um, back then. And the fact that the copyright law didn't make an exception for it um, was of tremendous uh, historical importance for everything we're going to see next. And on the other hand, it also introduced the fair use doctrine. Fair use refers to some exceptions to copyrights um, that you can use um, where you're getting sued by someone who's claiming copyright on something you did, basically. So, for example, if you're studying uh, some um, movie and you're only describing it for educational purposes and things like that, you might be exempt from following uh, the copyright uh, rules because that would fare under the fair use uh, doctrine. And ha that has been uh, tremendously important as well. So with all these things in mind, um, you know, towards the end of the 70s, programmers were increasingly uh, imposing restrictions on the software. And the academic culture that was in place in the 50s, 60s, 70s of just sharing the code, worry-free and so on, was starting to fall. And there's one anecdote that I uh, found quite, quite interesting from Richard Stallman. We're going to talk about him in a moment. At the time, he was a young student at MIT, and he was using a uh, markup language called Scribe. And the author of, of such system, Brian Wright, um, placed some time bombs in the source code so that um, users could not access an unlicensed copy of the software, basically. And apparently the reaction of Mr. Stallman was uh, that this was a crime against humanity. Not necessarily charging for the software, but restricting the user freedom. And this is going to be uh, a topic that is going to come up again and again for the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Now we arrive to the 80s, and we, I want to talk to you about the GNU project and the Four Freedoms, which is uh, still a precursor of the open source movement, which is the center of this talk, but it's crucial to understand everything that came after that. So the GNU project um, was um, an endeavor that Richard Stallman started, and the origins of it are quite interesting as well. We already saw what happened with the scribe uh, restrictions and so on. And then apparently there was one anecdote with uh, an office printer at MIT that kickstarted everything. So Richard Stallman had uh, added some custom code to the previous printer they had so that every time someone was printing a document and uh, would send a message to the administrator and also, if uh, there were too many jobs in the queue of the printer, it would send a message to the users that were waiting for uh, documents to be printed, basically. And this was uh, an additional development that was not provided by the printer vendor and that uh, Richard Stallman did. And then at some point, um, the department decided to buy a new printer and he suddenly did not have access to the source code. So his uh, initial development to add all these messaging systems and so on was uh, rendered useless. And uh, apparently this was the moment uh, Mr. Stallman realized that um, retaining user freedom and protecting it was the most important thing he wanted to devote his life to. So Mr. Stallman sent an email to different mailing lists in 1983, 
that said, starting this Thanksgiving, I'm going to write a complete Unix compatible software system called GNU for GNU, not Unix, and give it away free to everyone who can use it. Contributions of time, money, programs, and equipment are greatly needed. And this is considered the beginning of the GNU project. So initially, the idea was to develop a complete operating system. And for that, they needed a couple of things. So they needed a kernel, and they needed some utilities that would be more user-facing and that would sit on top of such kernel. And there is one word in this announcement that's critical uh, because Mr. Salman said that he wanted to give it away free to everyone who can use it. And uh, Richard Stallman has spent most of his life after this email clarifying that he meant free as in freedom and not as in free beer. And I find that um, completely fascinating because I'm a Spanish uh, native speaker and in Spanish, the word free and gratis are two different words. But uh, of course, this distinction doesn't exist in English. So um, it's uh, so interesting how language uh, can condition these uh, uh, misconceptions. So after starting with the GNU project development, uh, Stallman wrote the GNU Manifesto in 1985, and he established the Free Software Foundation, a nonprofit that would protect the interests of the GNU project and user freedom. Um, this organization still is active to this day. And in fact, Richard Stallman is still um, the head of the organization um, almost uh, 40 years on. And then in 1986, um, the Free Software Foundation wrote the four freedoms. And these were the underpinnings of everything that came after that in the free software movement. So freedom zero, because of course they were programmers and they wanted to start with zero, is the freedom to run the program for any purpose. This means that nobody can restrict uh, for what do you want to use the software for. And we're going to see that this has some implications that still reverberate to our day. Freedom one is the freedom to study and change the program, which was, of course, primarily useful for hackers themselves, because uh, the moment any software would not work for whatever reason, uh, they would want to see the source code, possibly change that, and so on. And then freedoms two and three uh, refer to the freedom to redistribute copies of the software. So essentially, uh, the moment you have a software, you should be able to give it away to your friend or neighbor. And finally, the freedom to distribute modified versions of the software. Therefore, if you are studying a software and you have the freedom to change it as well, you should also have the freedom to distribute those modified versions to other people. And it's really important to understand that uh, the spirit of these freedoms is that they should, they must be retained by people um, uh, using them. What does this mean? So imagine that I take a software and I study it, I change it, but then I want to sell copies for it and not distribute the source code. By doing that, I would be breaking the freedom of other users. And so this would go against the ideas of the Free Software Foundation and the GNU project. Um, the consequence of that is that the licenses that the GNU project created, uh, which are called the GNU Public Licenses or GPL, um, they're said to be copyleft licenses in the sense that uh, these four freedoms are transmitted in a transitive way. So everybody that receives a copy of the program uh, must be able to retain these freedoms, otherwise they would be in breach of the license. And as I was saying before, this was the beginning of a revolution, but also the beginning of a huge uh, misconception. And you can see in lots of different conference talks, written materials by the FSF and so on, that uh, when we are talking about freedom here, we're talking about uh, freedom and not uh, a matter of price. 
Um, in fact, the difficulty of putting a price tag to software while retaining all these four freedoms has given birth to lots of different business models. And this is still something that lots of entities and companies and freelance developers are trying to figure out. Meanwhile, in Switzerland, uh, by the end of the 80s, there was someone called Tim Berners-Lee that was starting to imagine how a new information system would look like to organize the documents of CERN, the um, particle accelerator that's uh, across Switzerland and France. And this would give birth later on to what we today call the World Wide Web. So now we enter the 90s and this is where the things start getting interesting and accelerating a lot. At this point, I will not be able to retain a linear uh, time travel anymore because there were so many things happening at the same time. And this is now going to become a constant uh, for the rest of our history. So in 1991, um, the World Wide Web was uh, open to the public. It had been in development for some years already, as I mentioned. And the truly interesting thing is that CERN made the WWW protocol and the code available royalty free. So in a sense, they took these ideas of um, software freedom and so on, and they applied them to something as foundational as the web. So thanks to this generous decision by this research, this European research institution, and we have um, public infrastructure for our digital world today. And what you see here on screen is a screenshot of the first web browser ever, which is called Mosaic. And this is Mosaic owns a website uh, back how it looked in 1997. And this, of course, was only the first of many web browsers that came after that. But the elements um, that are common to all of them, so the HTML markup language, HTTP as a protocol, and so on, were already there back at the beginning of the 90s. At the same time, a young computer science student in Finland, Linus Torvalds, also in 1991, sent an email to a few mailing lists saying, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like you knew, for 38680 clones. This has been brewing since April and it's starting to get ready. And if you remember from the GNU project, the original idea for the GNU operating system needed two things the kernel and the utilities. The utilities, the utilities had been uh, seeing lots of progress during uh, the late 80s and so on. And they had basically a re-implementation of the Unix system that they already knew from their interaction uh, with these old computers that I mentioned at the very beginning. But they were not quite ready to have a kernel. They had a project called the GNU Herd that to this day is still in development and hasn't gone very far. But the truly revolutionary here, uh, thing here is that by combining the Linux kernel as it came to be uh, named and the GNU utilities, um, we had the GNU slash Linux family of operating systems that I'm going to be calling Linux uh, for the rest of the presentation for brevity. And the coolest thing about Linux is that at that point, dozens and dozens of Linux distributions started to appear. This distorted chart that you can see on the left is a graph of all the different distributions that have ever existed and what was the originating distribution of all of them. It's literally impossible to count them all and it's all happened in a really, really short period of time. Remember that Linux was uh, announced in 1991. In 1993, there was the first distribution of Linux called Slackware. And when I say distribution here, I mean 
uh, collection of a desktop environment, the GNU utilities, and some extra stuff. Then in the same year, in 1993, the Debian distribution was uh, created, and this came to be among the most successful Linux distributions ever, um, parent to Ubuntu, Linux Mint, uh, and many others. And in 1994 and 1995, there were two commercial um, Linux distributions. And this is really interesting because they, in a way, they were fulfilling the dream of Richard Stallman of having software that could be free, I think freedom, but at the same time, they could be build a viable business on top of it while still distributing the source code. So these two distributions are SUSE Linux and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And this last one uh, was the parent of Fedora, uh, CentOS, and many other distributions uh, based on this family. But even beyond the uh, creation of the World Wide Web and the birth of Linux, we also were having at the same time an explosion of programming languages that were appearing um, super quickly. So in 1991, um, Guido Van Rossum, a programmer and mathematician from the Netherlands, created Python, which is the software that I've been um, working with for half my life. So I owe it uh, my whole professional career, basically. Um, and also in that same year, the R programming language was uh, created by Ross Ihaka, a uh, researcher in New Zealand. Also, Bram Mullenar, a programmer from the Netherlands, created the Veeam editor, and uh, it's still uh, popular to this day. In 1992, the X Windows system was ported to Linux, which uh, made it possible to have uh, visual interfaces on Linux uh, very early on. In 1993, some researchers from Brazil, Roberto Yerusalimsky and many others created the scripting language Lua that is very popular for the video game uh, community. And Leslie Lapper from the USA created LaTeX. Um, Python was al already gaining traction for the scientific numerical community and both numeric and num uh, numeric was created and this was the precursor of NumPy which appeared some years after that. And in 1996, Java was created by James Gosling from Canada. And this came to be one of the most important enterprise programming languages of the following two decades. So you see, all these things were happening at the beginning of the 90s. And this all culminated in 1997 with the uh, writing of the essay, The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond. And so, the idea from Eric Raymond here was that um, the previous generation of free software had been developed uh, behind closed doors. So everybody could get the codes and everybody could get the four freedoms. But in between releases, nobody could see the intermediate stages of the software and uh, the mailing lists were private and so on. And this is what Raymond called the cathedral model. And then he dubbed the Linux development model, which was completely different because everything was happening in the open and Linux was uh, sharing how he was or was not merging patches and so on. And he called these the bazaar models. And he coined uh, what he called the Linux law, which says, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, which is a way of saying uh, that security by obscurity is not the way to go. And instead, we should strive for transparency. And the more transparent we are, the sooner we're going to find the problems in our code. And again, this is one idea that still reverberates to our uh, time. And I find it so fascinating that all of this was a consequence of this um, exciting period at the beginning of the 90s. However, there were also some uh, interesting happening, interesting things happening on the business side of things uh, that will have tremendous consequences as well. So in 1994, the Netscape Corporation was founded uh, to, to produce a different uh, web browser that was called uh, Navigator, so Netscape Navigator. Uh, 
they introduced the JavaScript programming language in 1995. And later that year, the company went public. So this was considered the beginning of what would uh, in the end be the dot-com bubble. And we're going to see what the consequences were of that. At the same time, some very young uh, students in the Stanford University, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, had just started uh, creating the very basics of what then would become Google, one of the most powerful uh, tech corporations these days. This all uh, activity uh, culminated in 1998 uh, when the open source term finally became official. So influenced by Eric Raymond's essay, um, Netscape released the source code of the browser. And this was so uh, shocking and unusual that uh, it sent waves through the tech industry and motivated lots of uh, enthusiasts and technologists to try to uh, channel that energy. This uh, open Netscape Navigator was the precursor of Firefox, which is, uh, again, a browser that we still use to this day. So there was a strategy meeting, and uh, several people were present there. Um, so A. Raymond uh, himself, Bruce Perens, who is there in the picture, and many others. And they were discussing about the fact that this terminology, this free software thing, was uh, too confusing. And also, there were hints that uh, the fact that these uh, freedoms had to be transitive, so they were forced to transmit them to downstream users, that was not very interesting for corporations. So Christine Peterson uh, from the United States in that strategy meeting suggested using the term open source instead of free software, which was a term that was already in use uh, at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s. Um, but she is credited with uh, coming up with the idea of using it more broadly. So Bruce Perens then, with the help of Eric Raymond, founded the Open Source Initiative. And that same year, Tim O'Reilly um, organized uh, what he called an Open Source Summit. And they started spreading the word about the new terminology and all these new ideas. Interestingly, the open source definition did not mandate that these freedoms are transmitted to users. And so this created a divide in the community because even though Richard Stallman at some point had considered embracing the open source terminology, um, at some point um, he realized that uh, there was a subtle but very important philosophical difference between the two in that open source was not guaranteeing the downstream uh, freedom of the users. And so sadly, he devoted a very uh, large part of his life uh, to fight open source uh, proponents. And hence, this divide was created um, that still um, is mentioned by many members of the community to this day. So we're about to finish the 90s and uh, we're about to enter the new millennium. And I want you to fixate on this image on the right because uh, it might not seem uh, too, uh, too long ago, but the truth is that what we today take for granted, so having everything on digital storage uh, is something that's relatively new and um, historians usually consider 2002, so 22 years ago, the beginning of the digital age. So up to that point, there was more analog, more information stored in analog means than in digital means. But then after that point, there was an exponential growth in hard drives, uh, CDs, DVDs, even digital tape. Uh, and so on. So that was the moment that uh, marked the true beginning of the digital era. And with this explosion of 
data everywhere came, of course, the big data era. But we're going to get to that in a moment. Before that, it's mandatory to talk about the dot-com bubble. So with the advent of the new web and all these open source technologies uh, and the miniaturization of computers and so on, there was this fever and everybody wanted to get into the internet and do digital business. So this created a bubble that reached its peak in 2020. And then uh, most of these companies in the lapse of two years or less, they completely disappeared or saw their value wiped off by more than half. So this was a very dramatic uh, moment um, that was seen by many as a big disappointment in the potential of the internet. But in the end, it was uh, the dynamics uh, of the market. In 2001, too, the corporate animosity towards open source reached its peak. And uh, it's impossible not to remember this quote by Steve Ballmer, who was the CEO of Microsoft uh, back then, uh, who took over from, um, from Bill Gates. And he, sa he said at some point that Linux is a cancer that attaches itself uh, to everything it touches. It was a very... It was a terrible way of communicating this idea of the transitive um, freedoms of the GNU licenses. Um, but uh, this wording resonated with the industry for a very long time. However, while Microsoft was having this position, then the open source players were starting to organize. So in 1999, um, the Apache Software Foundation was established. Uh, that is still thriving to this day and underpins lots of the um, data uh, fundamentals such as Apache Parquet, um, Apache Arrow, and so on. In the year 2000, the Linux Foundation was established and uh, they employ Linux Torvalds to this day and they're a very successful coalition of companies uh, pushing for the development of the Linux kernel. In 2001, the Python Software Foundation was established also in the USA, and they started creating the um, uh, trademark for the language, and soon after organizing the PyCon and so on. And back in Europe in 2004, the Eclipse Foundation uh, was established, uh, which was uh, also very influential, especially in the 2000s. But also, the contenders for Microsoft's dominance um, were embracing these knowledge sharing uh, ideas, which was uh, accelerating um, the innovation to a pace that had never been seen. So in 2003, Google released this uh, Google file system paper. And the next year, they uh, released the map reduce ideas. So this two were essentially a realization of how it was cheaper for them to scale out, therefore have more computers process um, the tasks instead of having more powerful computers, and how they were distributing the tasks uh, around those and having um, redundancy um, uh, mechanisms baked into the systems and so on. But mind you, these, was, these were just uh, academic papers that described the ideas. However, in, 2000, in 2005, one of the big tech giants at the time, Yahoo, started implementing those ideas, and they did that in the open. So this culminated in the release in 2006 of Hadoop, which then became the basis of the whole uh, big data craze um, for the next uh, 10 years. Hadoop is not a project that is um, very popular these days, but it was nevertheless the first wave of technologies that enabled companies to process petabytes of data um, using fully open source technology. And finally, um, something that was extremely influential as well was happening on the side. So in 2005, um, Linus Torvalds from the Linux kernel fame 
was paced because they were using a proprietary um, version control system and they were enjoying a free license, but at some point the company took the license uh, from them and they revoked it. And so Linus Torvalds took some uh, time off and he wrote the Git distributed version control in one month. I find this uh, extremely impressive. And then he uh, gave maintenance to Junio Hamano, who has been a core contributor to the system for many, many years. And Linux went back to kernel development. But this time, everybody was using uh, Git. And, you know, Git is uh, it's a tool. It's a command line tool. Um, but it had no collaboration layer. In fact, the way the Linux kernel is developed is over mailing lists. And people exchange uh, software patches on there with uh, the lines they want to uh, modify and so on which back then was a very advanced system. And to the best of my knowledge, they still keep using that. However, for projects that were smaller in scale than the Linux kernel, having all this uh, collaboration layer was um, very annoying. And in 2008, GitHub launched, and this has become uh, the biggest and most important repository of uh, open source and free software uh, ever. And the interesting thing is that this put the idea of Eric Raymond's bazaar into practice because now on GitHub, you can see all the history of commits. You can open issues. You can send a pull request. Essentially, you can see all the development process in the open. So um, this fulfilled the dream of um, spreading open source far and wide but also it introduced these social aspects into the development. In 2011, which is the cutoff point that I chose for uh, this uh, section, Mark Andreessen, who was also one of the founders of Netscape uh, some years prior, wrote this article, Why Software is Eating the World, uh, which uh, again reverberated with the tech industry and unleashed a new wave of um, innovators that were drawn to the fresh world of open source software. And so we reached the, the past decade, uh, 2012 to 2018. I'm going to accelerate uh, now a little bit um, because by this time, and uh, judging by the demographics of um, the umbrella, most of us were already alive and some of us were already even contributing to open source. And this is where um, some cracks started to appear in the whole system. So there was this notion that software was eating the world and later on that open source was eating software. But what do maintainers eat was the question that everybody was asking. And there's this famous XKCD uh, cartoon that depicts the whole modern digital infrastructure depending on a project that some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. And to be honest, the reality is not far off uh, from that. So during this decade, we had an immense growth of the Python programming language driven mostly by the data science craze. So bear in mind that uh, the pandas library created by Wes McKinney um, was uh, unveiled in uh, 2010, 2009, more or less. And during this time, Python became the number one option to do all sorts of data manipulation. And at the same time, scikit-learn uh, became the most important classical machine learning framework in existence. But while all these things were happening, the world was discovering that open source was not sustainable at all. So it was built on top of maintainers' uh, free time. And, you know, in the 80s, 90s, all of these projects started as fun projects that, in the words of Linux Torvalds, you know, would never become big and professional. And people were doing them for fun, to scratch their own itch, to learn with their peers and so on. But suddenly we had all these 
a massive infrastructure that was built on top of this uh, very fragile, fragile projects and uh, some vulnerabilities started to appear. So, for example, OpenSSL, which powers most of the secure web browsing uh, that happens today, had a vulnerability that was very easy to exploit. And that day, um, the world realized that OpenSSL was basically maintained by one person. And so there was a coalition of companies that started putting money into this project, but uh, there were many similar stories that were unfolding over the years. Another example of, that, of something that happened was um, this left pad story. So uh, basically, uh, Asad Kosulu, a programmer that was living in the USA, pulled LeftPad, which is a, which was a extremely short JavaScript library, uh, a library so short that the whole source code could fit in like 11 lines of code, as you can see here in the screenshot. And he was pissed because of some of the decisions of the node package manager. And one day he decided to remove his library. And it turns out that thousands and thousands of projects were dependent on that. And the continuous integration systems of virtually all the web ecosystem, web front-end ecosystem, uh, completely broke. And this was something that was in the news uh, during months back then. In 2016, Nadia Iqbal, um, a former lawyer from the USA who became super interested in the whole open source, wrote this seminal book, Roads and Bridges, with the Ford Foundation, uh, in which she uh, explained all the ways in which open source projects were organizing, how maintainers were uh, motivated to do what they were doing, and so on. And it was an essential piece of work that uh, helped us understand how this whole ecosystem was evolving. Finally, um, towards the end of the past decade, the open source ecosystem began to fragment in two opposite directions, but for many different, for very similar reasons. So on one hand, businesses that were using open source or even copyleft licenses started to see that um, their competitors were taking their code and competing with them, basically. And some companies saw this as normal, uh, but some others were not so happy with the outcome. So lots of non-open source licenses started to appear. So we had the first source in 2015, the business source license from MariaDB in 2016, the commons clause in 2018, the server-side public license in 2018. All of these licenses, in one way or another, were restricting the competition. So, for example, they're telling you that you can take the code, you can do whatever you want with it, but they were restricting freedom zero, freedom of purpose, and telling you that you could not take that code and sell it, for example, or you could not take that code and do a managed service on top of it. This was a tool for companies to protect their innovations. Um, but, you know, there was a period of confusion during these years because they tried to pass these licenses as open source uh, because maybe they were open in spirit. But the open source initiative had very clear guidelines of what the open source definition was. And they rejected all the requests to consider the, any of these licenses uh, truly open source. At the same time, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, people were concerned that open source software was being used for um, nefarious purposes. So, um, for example, there's a family of projects that created the copyleft licenses, and these essentially are a family of copyleft licenses, but they mandate that only cooperatives and other non-capitalistic actors could use the code. And then Ada Coraline, uh, in 2018, she created the Hippocratic license, or Do No Harm license, after she saw that uh, GitHub was uh, working closely with uh, ICE, with the Department of Immigration uh, of the US government. And she wanted to create a, a license that um, developers could use to put their code out there and make sure that this would never be used for 
uh, purposes of war, discrimination, and so on. And they also tried to submit these as open source licenses. In fact, uh, Coraline ran for the open source initiative election at some point. But again, they were restricting freedom zero. So they were putting constraints on the purpose that was allowed for the software. So again, these are not considered open source licenses and the OSI rejected them all. But we started to see this tension uh, emerging right here. And then in 2018, old enemies became friends and Microsoft who had said um, 20 years prior that Linux was a cancer was embracing open source uh, for once. So Satya Nadella, who was the next CEO after Steel Barmer, completely changed the culture of Microsoft. And in 2018, they uh, acquired GitHub, effectively becoming the biggest um, code repository in the world. And now, 2019, 2023, um, I only included one album cover here because we're in the middle of the decades. So I'm hoping to discover some new music in the coming years. And of course, we are now in the post open source era and uh, being affected by the generative AI volcano. And I'm just going to say a couple of words um, about this because there's truly no need to say anything else about uh, generative AI. You've seen all of it all over the place. You've probably played with some of these systems, DALI, DALI 2, Mid Journey, um, Stable Diffusion, but also ChatGPT and all the derivatives uh, and so on. But one really important thing is that these companies are now facing some lawsuits from journalists, artists, and so on. And OpenAI, the company that's behind um, ChatGPT, recognized that it's impossible to create useful AI models without copyrighted material. And I find this so fascinating that we're going back to 1976 and the Copyright Act in the USA and essentially questioning what does it mean for copyrights uh, in the modern era, you know? Um, I'm sure uh, some of you have had, maybe depending on where you live, some problems when you were downloading uh, torrents, or piracy movies or TV series and things like that. Um, but it turns out that the current generation of generative AI models uh, was created from data sets made of scraping the whole internet um, using images without consent because uh, you cannot retrieve consent at scale like that. Um, and using source code that was on GitHub and that had very strong licenses, for example, strong copyleft licenses. So there's a very interesting question now about what happens when Copilot, for example, gives you a chunk of code. Is that a derivative work by the definition of the GPL? And as such, should you release that under a copyleft license? So suddenly, Copilot, ChatGPT, and so on have become black boxes that somehow shield us from all the effort that the digital pioneers put in the 80s, 90s, uh, and the zeros and so on. And we're still in the process of figuring out how should we proceed next. And also the amount of computational resources that training and even using the system, the systems requires is just out of this world. So some Altman um, reportedly is looking for 7 trillion US dollars of funding. These are American trillion. And he wants to create a competition against uh, NVIDIA so that uh, OpenAI and other companies do not depend on NVIDIA's GPUs to train and do inference with these generative AI models. But if you put this 7 trillion into perspective with anything, the GDP of your country or the budget that uh, we would need to end world hunger or anything like that, it's just astonishing. So whether or not we will be able to uh, gather these resources in a moment in which we're starting to face water scarcity, 
climate change and so on is um, up to debate. We're right in the future as we speak. There's this thread that is active. I am uh, slightly participating on it that is trying to figure out what term should we use for licenses that are not really open source, but are open source in spirit and companies want to use them to protect their innovations while at the same time uh, give back to the software commons. So this is a coalition led by um, Chad Witakre and David Kramer from Sentry. There's lots of other companies involved and there are many names that have been proposed and you can um, make your own contribution and write history um, just by commenting on GitHub. And I'm going to leave the presentation here. I think I spoke a lot. I truly hope that you liked it. Um, what's next? Nobody knows. Only a big uh, question mark. This could be a proliferation of non-open licenses. This could be lots of lawsuits against uh, GNAI models or maybe a redefinition of how copyright even works. The truth is that nobody knows, but uh, we are here. We're at the forefront of it and we can make a dent uh, on this and become uh, one more with these pioneers that have been building the digital infrastructure for the past 50 years. So thanks everybody for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much, Juan Luis, for that presentation, awesome presentation for taking us back several decades. Um, thank you everyone for listening in. You can now leave your questions in the question and answer tab or in the chat. We still have some uh, 10 minutes to go over the questions with the speaker. So there was uh, there's a few comments here in the chat. Uh, Harry Kraus, thanks a lot. Uh, I think you're you're adding lots of uh, interesting historical bits here about AT and T uh, and so on. So thanks for mentioning that. For example, I'm reading out loud. Um, multics, the multics environment failed a development multi-user. So then it was quote unquote castrated and became Unix. It also was multiple years after the successful development of the S. 360, which still directly exists today as System Z and runs most of the world's business transactions. The Unix people couldn't build anything advanced and AT&T was a regulated monopoly, so they couldn't sell software. And since it was very primitive, they gave away the source code, which made it popular with university teachers. That is a very interesting uh, detail as well. There's this uh, notion now that innovation can only happen in private companies. And I think the 70s and the 80s were a testament that uh, this was not true. ATT also used Unix in the phone switches, purpose-built computers. Bella was always part of at and until they split in 1984. Um, I'm going to continue reading. Thanks a lot, Harry, for all these uh, contributions. So LeQ is quite interested in open source art or open source museums, if there's any. That's interesting. I don't know of any, but if anybody knows of an open source museum, please drop a comment. Um, Gloria asks in the Q&A, do you think the open source community divide was avoidable? Will it ever resolve? That question could make it for another talk. Um, but long story short, I don't think it was avoidable because it goes to a very deep uh, philosophical distinction. However, having said that, I think, you know, there's lots of people that are still stuck in this divide from the 90s and so on. Um, but I think in the past 30 years, software has changed so much and it's become so ubiquitous that uh, for certain kinds of things, I don't think it makes sense to talk about freedom uh, in such an abstract sense. For example, um, if I'm using LibreOffice, which is the 
uh, free software alternative to Microsoft Office, right? But it's crashing or it's unstable or it doesn't have the functionalities that I want. Am I really free? Is it really an alternative? And I would love to spend more time talking to users, saying that, that as a product manager and developer advocate, right? Um, but yeah, I would love to see a more user-driven definition of what freedom and liberation looks like. That's not necessarily rooted in the 80s hacker culture, but takes into account smartphones, uh, office software, and everything. Um, Rajma asks, asks, are you optimistic about the future of open source in terms of support and funding? That's another very interesting question. Um, I wouldn't say, I don't want to call myself neither optimistic nor pessimistic, but the truth is that the whole funding model is wrong. You know, the, the whole digital infrastructure is built on uh, the spare time of people that are neglecting their families, their friends, their hobbies, which at the beginning they do it for fun, but at some point it becomes a job, an unpaid job, right? And nobody sees that transition coming. And I think, you know, in a sense, freelance developers will face more pressure to become entrepreneurs for themselves. So figure out small scale business models for their open source pet projects. And the moment they are more ambitious um, and given that we don't live in a zero interest rate world anymore, um, technologists will need to find business models that don't require you know, raising millions of dollars for from venture capital and instead like bootstrapping their businesses uh, much often. So I think there will be a variety of business models uh, being tried out. Also a variety of licenses. I'm not, I don't think we're going to stick to pure open source licenses. I think we're going to see more and more non-open source stuff that still, you know, puts the code away for free but restricts competition to protect innovation and so on. Same as patents work, right? A patent is releasing or describing your innovation in the open and protecting uh, you from competition. So I think we're going to see more of that. And in the end, we are reinventing the wheel of the patent system. Then Davon asks, what are your thoughts on the future of open source technology in relation to the Web3 ecosystem blockchain? I think, I mean, I don't think uh, Web3 is going anywhere, to be entirely honest. Uh, I think it was uh, something of 2021, 2022. Um, maybe we will see some innovation uh, going there, you know, but the fact that uh, Bitcoin has become a speculative asset, that NFTs were just uh, a fad and so on, doesn't make me very optimistic about Web3. I would, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, nobody can predict the future, of course. And the world is littered by quotes from people that said, you know, nobody is going to need like more than one megabyte of memory in the future and things like that, you know? So we humans are very bad at predicting the long term. Uh, and we also underestimate, overestimate the short term. So long story short, yeah, I'm not really a fan of uh, the whole blockchain thing. I also think it's like a sometimes a solution to a known problem. But I know there's lots of people that are very passionate about it and uh, blockchains enable a fully decentralized uh, technology and distributed autonomous organizations and so on. But I think it's a, it's a way of putting technology to a social problem without paying enough attention to the social problem that's underneath. So that's that's my answer. Can you talk a bit about open source program offices? Oh, there's um, a person that I know, uh, Ana Jimenez. She's like the biggest expert I know in open source program offices. She works at the Linux Foundation. So basically the idea here is that, you know, corporations are both consuming lots of open source and at some point, they, they give back uh, open source for whatever reason, right? Sometimes it's because they want their, their whole product is based on open source. 
Some of the times it's because um, you know, you're consuming some open source library and you made a fix and maintaining that internal fix for long forces you to kind of rebase on top of the, the original system. So it's just easier to contribute the fix back, uh, even just accounting for business reasons. And so open source program offices are initiatives inside companies that try to spread the word about good practices when interacting with open source and uh, creating inner source um, offerings as well. So uh, having like an internal marketplace in corporations in which different teams can produce uh, reusable components uh, applications and so on that are available to other uh, co-workers without being open, but being like internally open. Um, and yeah, in general, like uh, transmitting the open source way of working in corporations that maybe are not uh, digital native or whatever. If somebody works in a very big company, like an automotive company or, uh, you know, like a, some sort of industrial company and, and et cetera, and they were not born in the digital era and they're trying to understand how they can leverage open source, establishing an OSPO is the best way forward. But again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert uh, in this. Yeah, Harry Krauss uh, brought up the actual quote from Bill Gates. He said 600, 640K was more than anyone would ever need. Uh, yeah, I think it was. it's a very clear example of someone being really bad at predicting the future. And I could be completely wrong about Web3 in the same way. Um, so Likyu asks in the chat, what do you think about the potential of the UFADS model that you mentioned? Could you please uh, repeat what the initials here are? UFADS. I don't know what it is about. Um, I'm still scrolling in the chat. Yeah, happy to clarify that. Um, ah, user-friendly, oh, okay. Um, I mean, the point with user-friendliness is that you need empathy towards the user, right? Developers are very good at building software for other developers because they understand their own needs. And that's why open source is massively successful for developer tooling, linters, compilers, editors, uh, web frameworks, things like that, you know, things that serve other developers directly. But then the moment you need to produce um, a text processor, which is probably like arguably the most boring kind of software in the world, or an alternative to Photoshop, like a GNU Imp, for example, um, or, you know, virtually any like web application that regular users that are not technologists need to use, that requires, you know, some uh, notion of what the user wants and so on. And some developers really don't want and don't like uh, having to talk to regular users, basically. And so I think we must find ways to work with design people, technical writers, you know, and in general see this uh, open source endeavor as a collective thing in which, you know, developers have a very strong set of skills, but it's not nearly enough to liberate uh, users, in my um, opinion. So I wish it became a universal new standard uh, in the future, but it will require effort uh, from ourselves because we will need to talk to each other basically, which is uh, arguably the most difficult thing ever. Yeah, I think um, you have tackled all the questions and the comments. Good to see some re emoji reactions down there and comments uh, of everyone saying thank you for the talk. Um, so I think with that, we can and the webinar, thank you everyone for joining our, our webinar today. The video, as said earlier, will be available on our YouTube channel in the next 24 to 48 hours. Feel free to like, leave 
any other questions or comments below the video chat and we can have one Lee, uh, Louise like um, comment or answer any other questions that uh, you might still have or might think of in the future. And also you can give us suggestions on other open source topics that you would like to hear from uh, the Data Umbrella community. And with that, I will now close uh, the webinar and thank you so much again. Looking forward to seeing everyone next time. Thanks everyone. Uh, let's connect on LinkedIn. Thanks again, Data Umbrella, for having me. And uh, looking forward to seeing you soon again.